You know, we walked in this morning and we uh, went to the, many of us went to the back to, to get a smell of, of what's cooking. I remember not long ago we uh, had brought some, we had a potato uh, supper and I remember the smell of those potatoes just seemed to come down that baptistry and just hit you right in the nose. And I know that we might be a bit anxious to partake in that wonderful spread that is back there and I'll just simply ask you that you would bear with me for a few moments. I hope that as we are prepared uh, to be fed today uh, by many, many different families bringing and sharing uh, food with the congregation and with each other in a time of fellowship, I also pray that we will be fed on the word of the Lord today. Thinking of homecoming services, you know, you think of all the food that has been prepared and the preparation that happened the night before. I, I think of a picture that, that come up on social media, and it wasn't real long ago, and this is probably every single Baptist uh, bulletin at one time or another. Where are we eating? If you spend any time with the church bulletin in front of you any time, you've probably jibbled out some notes on it and wrote those to one another. Well, to answer that question, where are we eating today? We're eating here. Hopefully you'll join us today and fellowship together. We'll answer that question very easily for you right here. It is a great time to be a child of God alive in Christ Jesus today. Amen? It's a wonderful time to be in Christ. These are exciting times for the church. Exciting times to be alive and part of the great commission that the Lord Jesus has left for his church. And it is my hope and prayer that we can find that footing in the obedience of the great commission that we would answer what is called the clarion call of the gospel. Wherever he leads, I will go. Clarion call, very precise, very sharp to the point you go and we obey. Now you might think that we have assembled this great crowd here today because it is homecoming Sunday. Friends and family have joined us and for that we are thankful. We are glad to have friends and family. We are grateful to be able to fellowship in that way. But the reason that we have this meeting today, the, the reason that we are here today is that we can make much of our Savior who has died for our sins. Charles Spurgeon said the most important daily habit we can possess is to remind ourselves of the gospel. Now, would it be much more important than brushing your teeth? Well, I want to be hopeful that you brush your teeth this morning. But the most important thing we can do as children of God in Christ Jesus is to remind ourselves daily of what Jesus has done for us. I don't think we do that enough. You might say, well, preacher, I don't need it. I don't need to remind myself of that. We already know about the gospel. We already know about what Jesus did. We already know about the death and the burial of, of Jesus. Why do we need reminding? Because we are so prone to wander and stray from the Lord who saved us. That's why. We are so prone to go and do our own thing. So prone to stray from the Lord. That without the Spirit of God we would have gone down the road of sin and separation. And we would never stop moving from being wayward. So I'm thankful that we can be reminded of the gospel. And it's the very reason for preaching. The very reason for preaching is that we is because we're so prone to forget. Jerry Bridges, author and theologian, said, The gospel is not only the most important message in all of history, it is the only essential message in all of history. Think of that. The most important message in all of human history. And it is probably the most neglected by us. If you have your Bibles, I hope that you have turned to Jonah through the reading of our word. I want to examine the first chapter of the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. 
If you were with us last week, uh, we looked at some overarching themes of the book of Jonah. We talked about the authorship. We talked about the date of Jonah. We talked about some very specific themes to the book of Jonah. We spoke about forgiveness. We spoke about wickedness. We spoke about repentance. We spoke about mercy and grace. We spoke about God's sovereignty. And these are things that we're going to continue to talk about as time goes on. But for those that are visiting with us today, and our church folks as well, our, our, our folks who are not considered visitors, if you will, I want to offer us all a challenge. I'm going to be in the book of Jonah for probably four more weeks. Can I offer you a challenge for those visiting today? May I challenge you to come back next week, if you can? If you don't have a home church, would you come and let's walk through this book together? I'll simply ask that you return for the next few weeks as we work through Jonah. And I know that you will see, this is why, this is why the challenge is going forward. Because I know that you will see through the pages of the book that we are reading, through the book of Jonah, you will see a God that seeks to save and redeem. You will see a God that would listen to the cry of those in repentance and answer that cry. And so the book ask this question. Through the book of Jonah, are you more like Jonah or are you more like God? Now, automatically we would say we're more like Jonah. No one in here would say I'm probably more like God. Preacher, what are you trying to do? Trap me in a question? You're trying to trick me? Is this some trick question? Are you more like Jonah or are you more like God? It's not a trick question. Are we more like Jonah in the fact that he ran from the calling of God and was angered when God saved his enemies? Or are we more like God who seeks to see people repent of their sin and live a life of righteousness? Think of someone right now that you would think of to be your worst enemy. Hopefully you don't have any worst enemies, but if you do, think of those folks. What if Jesus saved them? Would we rejoice or be angry? So are we more like God or are we more like Jonah, prone to be angry, prone to run from the calling of the Lord? In this past decade, there has been two to seven million Muslims come to faith in the Lord. Now, you might be asking me why I am referencing the Islamic or the Muslim world. And I'll tell you in just a moment. Recently, a World Magazine writer, Warren Cole Smith, interviewed 25-year missionary David Garrison who documented his findings about the Muslim phenomenon. There is a revival in the Muslim world, he says. A revival Garrison says he believes that two to seven million former Muslims have converted to Christianity in the past two decades. And for the church, we should say hallelujah, shouldn't we? His book, A Wind in the House of Islam, contains impressive research to back up his claims. Well, preacher, why are you mentioning Islam? Well, obviously there has been not a revival a revival is for those who have been vived or brought alive. This is for those who were dead in their trespasses and sin. And Jesus came and saved two to seven million in a people group. We could take where Jonah is at. And, and there should be a slide that will show you that map. We shared this with you last week. You could take this map, take it out, lift it out and pose it in the modern day context and what you will find is a land that is predominantly occupied by Muslims. So we could take this map and just set it right in. If you know the map of Jonah's initial descent to Tarshish, you know this area is occupied by Muslims. And to here, even in light of persecution, that's what we hear about most of the time, isn't it? Because it is prevalent. That is what's happening. But even in light of persecution, Christ is still changing lives. Christ is still changing people. This is an amazing supernatural movement of the Lord. Make no mistake about it. What should this do for you and me? What should this do? Well, number one, it should shake us to our core and say, what are we doing? It should get us excited. For you, it might be hard for you to get excited for a people group that you think have exhibited terrorist acts against the United States. A person that might consider you an infidel and Jesus came to save them. But God is changing the lives 
in this world for His glory. And this should move you to rejoice. Who was once your enemy is now saved and redeemed and are a brother and sister in Christ? Now what does this have to do with Jonah? It helps us to be reminded of the power of God to save. And more than often, even in light of our own reluctancy to share the good news with others. So let's examine Jonah. With our Bibles open before us, Jonah 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. Obeying the call is refusing to run. Obeying the call is refusing to run. That's kind of a, uh, a, a, a nonsensical thing to think. If a person is obeying the Lord, they are also not running from the Lord, right? But let's look together. Verse 1, we'll unpack this verse together. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... This is what he'll say in just a few moments. I don't want to stop right there. I want to examine this very first, uh, these very first words, the word of the Lord. You find that phrase, the word of the Lord, repeated seven times in the book of Jonah alone. Four chapters repeated seven times in the book. We find this phrase in Scripture 256 times in all of Scripture. It is almost like the Lord is repeating himself over and over again to add emphasis and to get attention, doesn't it? So if it says, the word of the Lord said, what must we do as his people? Listen. So the Lord uses this phrase over and over again in repetition to get our attention. Repetition is good. In fact, preaching of God's word is repetition. Repetition is good. It helps us to remember. It is good in songs. To repeat. It is good to repeat phrases over in songs. It is good in the word to hear. Consider the song, if you will. Think with me just for a moment. We talk about repetition in song. Think about this song, Glorify Thy Name. I want you to think of this song. In the wording of that song, it says, Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all of the earth. Verse 2 carries on. Instead of saying, Father, now it says, Jesus, we love you. We worship and we adore you. Glorify thy name in all of the earth. Verse number 3 says, instead of Father or Jesus now, it says, Spirit, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all of the earth. A classic hymn that is packed with theological truth and yet is repetitive. The only word that is changed in that song are the words Father, Jesus, Spirit. The verses are repeated over and over to add emphasis on the nature and character of God. So when God speaks, when the word of the Lord comes, we listen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And what is this message that we find in it in verse 2? Here's the great command. This is what all the commotion is over. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up to me. Here's the word of the Lord. Arise. Simple command. Get up. The introduction of Jonah's calling is hearkened by an arise. But it is met with the opposition of a prophet. Now I want you to, I want you to go to Nineveh. This is a great and it's a powerful city. So much so that this great city is the capital of Assyria. But why has the evil come up before the Lord? What is the context of this great evil? We can say, yeah, it was idol worship, it was paganism, evil coming up before the Lord. They were not god fears, obviously. But what is this great evil that had come up before the Lord? They were people that were brutal and they touted their terrible and horrible exploits of war. In fact, they would write in great detail how they would flay the skin of their enemy, how they would decorate, how they, how they would decorate their compound with the heads of their enemies, how they would take the ladies who were with child and they would slash a, in their stomach and then run them out into the wilderness to die with unborn child and mother. Horrible, horrible exploits of, of war and they would write in great detail and they would, and they would kind of, they were proud in that fact. They were people who desecrated the image of God. They desecrated human beings who are made in the image and likeness of their creator and God is going to destroy that city unless there is repentance. And that was the great city. 
the great sin has finally reached a point where the Lord is going to judge them. Just a bit about Jonah. He was sanctioned to go to Nineveh, which is about 550 miles from Jerusalem. May I say this? Sin has no resting place with the Lord. It always will be judged. There is no sin that has ever existed that will escape the judging eye of our Lord. Sin will be judged and it will be eradicated by the Lord Jesus by his death and his resurrection or it will still be in and on the person's life causing them to face a God that is, as the Bible describes, a consuming fire. What are we saved from? You ever had someone say, are you saved? What are we saved from? Or what are we saved to? Are we saved to heaven? Are we saved just so we can go to heaven? Or are we saved by the blood of Christ? Are we saved by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus? Are we saved so that we might not have to endure the wrath of God? And so this is the question. I mean, these are not scare tactics, by the way. These are truth tactics. I mean, we, could, we could talk scare tactics all, all evening. We can, we can drum up some things to try to scare you. In fact, the Lord gives us commands in the scripture, thou shalt not, thou shalt, in order for us to be prosperous in him and to glorify him. Now, what did Jonah do when pressed by God to go? What did he do? He probably did what most of us do. He fled. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Presence of the Lord could also be translated from the face of the Lord. He fled as far away as he could think from the face of the Lord. But this is just the amazing irony about it from this prophet Maybe he was just scared. Maybe he was just frightened. Maybe he just hated the Assyrians. Regardless, instead of going the 550 miles up north and to the west just a bit to Nineveh, as the Lord commanded, he went in the opposite direction, first to Joppa. And there he was looking for a ship that would take him to Tarshish. So the first leg of his journey, he went 40 miles down, just a little bit of Jerusalem, a little bit southwest of Jerusalem, to go to Tarshish, which is close to 2,500 miles from Nineveh. Do you think that he was running from the Lord? Do you think he was running from that calling? You think that he was running away from the Lord? Here's the ironic thing. Here's a prophet. Here's a prophet called by God who's supposed to know, thus saith the Lord. Here's a prophet of God that knew the character and nature of God. He knew that God was all-powerful. He knew that God was all-present and everywhere. He knew that God was the sovereign of the universe. And in somehow in his mind, he thought that running from God was going to be, was, he was going to escape the eye in the face of the Lord. So running in futility from the Lord, he set out towards Tarshish. He knew that he could not run from what the Lord called him to do. But just maybe, possibly he could. In his mind, he's thinking, maybe I could. Did he really think that, that this was going to happen by traveling 2,500 miles from the face of the Lord? Was he going to shake the Lord and somehow in his travels? The Lord isn't going to be able to find him or pinpoint him. I mean, here is, here is the, the, the king of all creation watching over his creation and somehow he thinks that he's not going to be able to find him. Do you think by not seeking and pursuing the holiness of God that that negligence permitted him from pursuing you? Do you think by our negligence to stand up and serve or somehow shy away from the things of the Lord it's going to in effect make the Lord somehow stop pursuing you to serve him? Do we somehow think that our negligence and somehow our inability to in our mind to serve him is going to make the Lord stop pursuing you. I'm thankful that the Lord does pursue us. Do you think the Lord forgoes the command for us to go simply based on our running? Do you think that our running from him makes the Lord say, no, you know what? The Great Commission ain't for him. I see he don't want to do it. I see he don't want to share, she don't want to share the gospel, so I'm just going to give up on it. That's the irony in these verses. He cannot travel any distance to escape the Lord of creation. He made the sea that Jonah was traveling on. Do you notice he paid the fare and the Bible says he went down? More that language is using his kind of descent. He went down 
Just to say that it is costly to disobey the call of God. It is costly to neglect what God has called you to do. It is costly to disobey what God has called the church to do. Do you think on a homecoming service that we would be more love? And there is love. God wants us to serve him. He wants us to love him with all that we have. And so a neglect to the call is disobedience to God. It is costly to neglect fellowship. There's a command in Hebrews that says, Forsake not the assembling together, which is a command for us to meet together. When we think the coming of the Lord is at hand, what should we do? We should meet more and more. It is costly to neglect fellowship. It is costly to neglect your family. It is costly to neglect your spiritual duty. And Jonah did. Look at him. He paid the fare. He paid. And he continues his descent, attempting to escape the face of the Lord. And by Jonah going his own way, he is making this emphatic statement that I will not go to Nineveh. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do it. I can remember the moment that I came to Christ, 1996. I was saved because I had a very, very persistent neighbor who knocked on my door every week, invited me to church. I remember one evening that Christ took my sins and forgave me. Forgave me. I was reborn. I was born from above. I was made a new creature in Christ. But I remember a few years after serving, serving him, I, I remember thinking and knowing that God had called me into serving him by way of teaching and way of preaching. Never in, my, never in a million years would I thought that he would have used me to be a pastor. I started teaching Sunday school at a, at a young age and Occasionally, I would fill the pulpit. From the years of 1996 to 2007, it took me that long to answer the call to preach. And I mean fully commit to preaching. Between those years, I would have every excuse in the book not to pursue theological training. Now, you can teach the Bible as long as you get in the Word. Uh, you can teach the Bible Sunday. It's not, it is not required that everybody have theological training. But if a man or God is called in the ministry, if they are called to handle the Word of the Lord, then it is necessary for them to get some theological training. And so I made every excuse in the world not to go to seminary. I said, well, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. Or we bought this house that we're living in. We need to stay here. It would be too costly to try to sell it. The economy is not, the economy isn't great right now. Or we will be moving far away from our family. Had every excuse. The list went on and on and on. And through all of these excuses that I opposed to the Lord, there was one constant in it all. His calling did not change. It never diminished. It never faded. It never failed to pursue me. I acted as if those excuses somehow would wash away what God has called me to do. Somehow that they would drown out the calling, but it never did. And this is exactly what Jonah was doing. He felt as if he got away from God. He thought that it would drown out the call that the Lord placed on him. So obviously the question is for us, how do we attempt to call uh, to drown out the call of God. When God has called us to go, what do we do? What do we do? We might say, the Lord can't use me. Yes, he can. We might say, I'm just too young. The Lord can use you. You might say, I'm too elderly. The Lord can use you. You might say, I'm just too busy to serve him. He can use you. Even in your busyness, he can use you. We might even be here today saying, God can't forgive me. I, I'm a sinner and I've done too much. Uh, well, welcome to the club. We're all sinners. Saved by the grace of God. In fact, my Jesus is in the business. <laughs> of taking a wretch who I am the chief. You could probably say that about yourself. Jesus is in the business of taking a wretch and transforming them into his likeness. In fact, he gets the glory for it. You can't be running if you're obeying. And maybe for you, you have not, you've not been in fellowship with the church for a while. And it's because it reminds you of your own sin. I know because I've been there. I'm the last person to flaunt any righteousness. And you could say that of yourself too. I'm the last person to flaunt righteousness. Look at number two. To obey the call can avoid damaging pitfalls. 
But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the, the ship threatened to break up. Just as demonstrate that God is, is omnipotent and omnipresent, and there was no running from the command of the Lord for his people, God hurls this great wind on the sea, and this severe storm broke out. The ship almost, I could imagine, it, it would seem as if the, the ship was going to fall to pieces and all would be lost. Now instead of the prophet dealing with his rebellion on his own in the confines by himself, now he has brought a, 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 a crew of sailors in with him. His rebellion and running from the Lord now has put other people's lives at risk. As if to say, sin is always costly and will always affect those around you. Jonah did not really think that uh, he was just going to pack up and leave his calling behind or maybe that's really what he thought. Maybe he had trust issues. Maybe it, was, uh, maybe it was fear that made him flee. A little bit of all of it probably. But I can say if Jonah would have stuck it out, went to Nineveh, that he would find there would have been joy in serving the Lord and being where God has called you. There is joy in serving God right where he has called you to serve. From a pastoral perspective, it brings me great joy to serve Jesus and his church. It's challenging, yes, but it brings great joy. In fact, Lifeway had asked a group of pastors how they felt, if they felt privileged to serve as pastors. Now, you might find uh, in a different statistics that, that is uh, not right across the uh, spectrum of, of social media, uh, but Lifeway had done this accurate, this accurate uh, survey. And they asked pastors if they felt privileged to serve as pastor. And 93% stated that they felt privileged. Are there challenges? Yes. But then they go on to 8 in 10 pastors, which is 79% disagree with that statement. That being in ministry has had a negative effect on their family. And that is 79% disagree with that statement. Now, back to the ship. I mentioned that to say this. There is joy in serving the Lord right where he has you at. Right where he has called you. But we're back on the ship. It was about to be torn to pieces by this otherworldly supernatural storm out of nowhere. And how do we know that? Well, the Bible says the Lord sent it. So the word of the Lord tells us that this was not your typical storm. The sailors knew that it was a supernatural event. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship with them to the sea to lighten their load. But Jonah had gone down in the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. Now here are the mariners that were afraid. You know mariners who make their living on the sea. They were sailors. They knew something about storms. In fact, they knew that this was something a little bit otherworldly. Each of his sailor cried out to their God. Basically, this was a pagan and polytheistic crew. They worshipped many, many gods. Now, apparently, they had shifted through their cabinet of gods and were not find any that were adequate to answer their prayer. The sailors are seeking the safety of their God who could not calm the storm because of their non-existence. And here Jonah is sleeping below the ship, almost fast asleep and in calmness. It seems pretty apparent that he was satisfied with his decision to run from the Lord, or maybe he was just simply exhausted. You can almost imagine the wind howling in and the timbers cracking beneath their feet, the crew scrambling, throwing the cargo over. And here is the prophet of the Lord below sleeping. Once again, this is one person's disobedience and now because of that, everyone is suffering. Sin just doesn't have a grip on one person. And what I mean by that, in the sense of your sin, you've got to repent for your own sin. I can't do it for you. But there is a sense to where sin has an effect on others in adverse ways. That's why church discipline is so important for the body. So they're on the way to Tarshish. Comfortable in sin. The Bible says in verse 6, the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, O sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we might not perish. So listen to the almost evident application. It's almost evident without me even bringing out this application. The ship master came down to Jonah and asked, How in the world are you sleeping? How in the world are you sleeping through this mess? 
And then the call goes out to get up as emphasized as, Get up! Call on your God! Uh-oh. <laughs> Jonah's in trouble now. Call on your God. How would he call on the God that he has seemed to abandon? As to where the sailors' gods were lifeless, no life, no breath in them, Jonah knew the living God. And it's a shame that pagan sailors prayed more than the supposed man of God, even if it was indeed to a false cabinet of deities. These men who were lost were not god fears, and they prayed more than the so-called prophet of God here. Perhaps Jonah's God would give thought about them that they might not perish. Here's the irony. Isn't that the mission that Jonah was on in the first place? To go to Nineveh and to preach because, because God has prepared them a word so that they might not perish? And still the prophet has to be reminded by the ungodly to pray. We know a prophet of the Lord was to distribute the word of the Lord and give instruction. Sometimes those words were good words. Most of the time they were corrective words calling to repent. And Jonah was a person who was supposed to represent God, was supposed to represent Yahweh. But it seemed that he only represented himself. It's a sad, sad commentary when the ungodly or sinners have to remind you who you're supposed to be. It's a sad commentary when those in the world can say, hey, aren't you supposed to be a deacon? Hey, aren't you supposed to be a preacher? Hey, aren't you supposed to be a pastor? Hey, aren't you supposed to be somebody who's happy and not complaining? Aren't you supposed to be a person who believes in the power of prayer? Aren't you supposed to be a person who's telling me about Jesus? If that's the most important thing to you, then why are you not telling me about Jesus? It's a sad commentary when the ungodly or sinners have to remind you of who you are. Now, they probably had no spiritual inclination to what they were doing, but God used it to speak. God used it to, he uses it to poke us. So how are you faring today in your walk with Christ? Maybe this is a cry for the church to wake up. Maybe this is a call for you to wake up out of your slumber. Maybe it's a call for you to pray to the God that has saved you. Paul reminds the early church at Rome of the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says to them, this is necessary. What? To exalt the command to love your neighbor as yourself. It is already time for you to wake up from your sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we became believers. And I believe that that statement is much more nearer than when Paul wrote it. Amen? It is time for the church to stop running from the commission that the Lord has laid on our feet. It is time to quit hiding from the task that is at hand of making disciples. It is time for the church to answer the call of the Lord. It is time for the church to quit playing church and to wake up. These verses in Jonah teach us the valuable lesson of pushing on in the Lord, obeying what the Lord has before us because he has a task at hand for us to do. So my challenge would be quit running from the Lord and wake up. Let's pray.